welcome everyone. Um, my name is Simon Holmenal. This is Andreas. Hi everyone. Yeah, Ooh, he, I'm I, loud. we haven't really we kind of made a split minute, last minute decision to put Andreas on the spot here. I'm gonna maybe let him talk a little bit. I'm not sure. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> he works for us. We met here a few years ago, and, and, yeah. and he he's now part of our team. So we're Panoply. Uh, we um, we're a small design studio based out of London, but we're running everything fully remote. So Andreas is actually working from Austria. Yeah. Um, and it's, I should, I, I will keep talking over you. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but no, yeah, do you have good. anything you want to add to that? We have a lot to get through, so. Um, no, not really, but uh, <laughs> yeah. It's always good to yeah. get in touch here because uh, <laughs> this can happen. Yeah, yeah, shit can happen. Yeah, he got a job. <laughs> so, so we don't have a real, this is like some, a little loop that plays on the, you know, when you visit our website, it's just a little compilation of stuff that loops around. I didn't want to have it playing on stop because you won't be listening to what I'm saying. It's just like moving along. So we're going to um, start by playing a little... This one has audio, by the way. Um, so we're just going to start by running a quick reel of our Curiosity series, which is our studio projects that we do between projects. And then we're going to dive head on and it's going to be intense. We'll see how much we get to. <laughs> so enjoy. Uh, we'll be sitting down now, but now you've seen our faces. Enjoy the presentation. Okay, we're good. We don't have time for that, so let's <laughs> skip it. Um, welcome uh, again. We're Panoply, I mentioned that. We're a remote studio, uh, primarily. Um, we're going to be talking about using Houdini as a design tool and how you can scale your setups, speed up your workflows, a lot of PDG stuff, but basic stuff at the same time. We're using it for, you know, we're, we're beginners. Yep. You know, we're just trying. Uh, but uh, yeah, Panel Police Studio, we're going to start talking about a project called Derealization. This was a studio project that we did last year. Um, yep. And it, the idea is, I mean, how do we describe this? Derealization is a, is a condition where the world is essentially, um, where you, you have a traumatic experience that, it, that, that kind of dissolves real reality. You, you see things in, in ways that you know, isn't necessarily the reality, but it's a kind of a panic attack, think of it like that, that kind of thing. So we we built a few scenes, and this would have been a prime example for USD. Unfortunately, we started this yeah, a bit no. before, and we don't, re you know, it's, we're getting into it. But So we started with a few different scenes, and the whole film follows a simple narrative of a camera that is, it's the same camera in different scenes. It's different... Uh, parts of life. So we're starting in the early days in school. We have, um, we have like uh, travel, which is like, you know, commute and, and the, you know, state, like stage fright should be a part of this, but also, you know, you, you know, when people are panicked for being in a public space and stuff like that, it comes to the, with this. Um, obviously you have your work, uh, your office, and then you escape from all of that shit and you go into a, a kind of a nature, but this is a, a, even more than that. This is like an artificial nature because it's own climate controlled, uh, what do you call this? Biodome kind of thing? Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. English is neither of us native <laughs> language. So like yeah. We're just like struggling. You're living in the UK for a while, but... And then obviously home is meant to be your safe place, right? And then you go out to meet your friends in the evenings, or uh, whatever, going for a dinner or something. So these are the different scenes. We're going to talk about them uh, some more or less, and we'll see, see how much we get through, isn't it? Yeah, so I'm going to start by playing the film for those who haven't seen it. Uh, it's quite quick, so enjoy. Audio. Lights down. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anyway, that's it. Um, so that's the film. Um, it's contained all of these various scenes, and it's all based on, a, as I mentioned, the camera. And as soon as it reaches the tipping point, imagine you know, stuff falling off the surface. That's kind of the narrative, the visual narrative we use where the camera is kind of pivoting over the 90 degree uh, horizon. That's when things are going south. So the first scene being the, um, this one, they also loop into themselves. I'll just mute this. Um, so they basically are a perpetual loop, each one as well. And you can see there's a lot of different things happening. We have the lockers, we have the floor, then the ceiling. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to go into like the the breakdown of that a little yeah. bit in a minute. Um, so uh, I mainly worked on this uh, part of the of the derealization, and there was a lot of interesting problems that I wanted to tackle at, in the beginning because there was uh, I had built something similar to uh, a distort like something that takes quads and sort of replaces higher res geometry on those quads. And I had built that before even derealization started. And I thought it would be quite a fun, because Mark, um, and, uh, the other founding partner of Panoply, uh, built out like the skeleton for all of these scenes while we were working on something else, I believe. Roughly. Yeah. And um, I saw these lockers and I immediately thought this is perfect for trying this out. And um, so, yeah, we have a little uh, rundown. I don't know. It, I, I mean, we can do it together. We'll, we'll see. So this is kind of a quick breakdown of this effect, essentially, um, the locker aspect and how to expand. It's like semi-procedural, I would say, mm. like uh, the animation up front was done manually. We're starting by creating a bounding box for one of the lockers, instancing them around into a little cluster. And then the animation is essentially just extrudes. Yeah, it's just animated and extrudes. And offsetting there. So the key thing there, I guess, we don't go all the way to zero, right? Because we want to have a fixed point count. Exactly. Right. Right. So it's a little bit like <laughs> trickery. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the, the stupid solutions are the best ones. Um, yeah, it was kind of important to have the control over when they come in. And creating that procedurally would have been fairly easy, probably, but getting it to grow exactly the way you want it and the speed. Yeah, we pick our battles. Yeah. And this part here that we're talking that's coming on here, this is what's based on because sometimes when you use the extrudes, they don't necessarily give you a constant point order. So we have to kind of figure out the way of like managing which so that the locker uh, when they get essentially textured, the orientation of the, the orientation yeah. they don't come up upside down. So the first thing we do is restoring the the points of each primitive on an attribute and iterating through each primitive. And then we have this thing going on. We do our, everything in box because I'm a weirdo and I like <laughs> box. So, so this is the inside of that warp. 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 <laughs> um, and the first thing we're doing is we, we're going through each primitive. Uh, we're looking at the points of that primitive, and we're comparing the position of each point to the relative bounding box. The relative bounding box is essentially, if you imagine putting a bounding box around your polygon, essentially in this case, because we're going through each polygon. Um, and then you can get the zero to one value on each axis. So in this case, we're looking at, is it at the bottom of, yeah. of, of the shape? Um, and it loops through all of them. And it also checks against a constant value, um, which we kind of initialize the loop. And then it just picks up the first one. It finds that it's at the bottom. Um, that then gets used. Uh, we take the neighbors of that point. <laughs> and looking if they are like, are you above or below or next to, you know? So we find the one above it. And then from that, we're then generating a, a matrix that then we can use to kind of figure out what's up and what's down, basically. Long story short. There hasn't uh, been an easier way of doing this. <laughs> there might be, but to, fuck it, it works. <laughs> it's no wrong way of doing it. Um, so, yeah, so... That's that. We do some cross products based on a normal. So we need two vectors to create a matrix. So it's the normal and then also the the up vector, so to speak. It's not, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. So that's going through. Um, and then we're taking, essentially, we're inverting that matrix of every polygon and storing the rest position. Uh, we normalize it. Not necessarily necessary, but we did that. Um, and then we're taking a polygon that we know the orientation of, and then essentially is applying the rest position of the other one because they're now like in the same coordinate space. So, they can kind of like. so that way we know that every t every one of these polygons are going to have a certain point order where we know what's up so that the lockers don't come up upside down 
which probably would have been fine. Or sideways. That or, was si or sideways, which is even worse. But it would probably would have been even more with the concept. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> like maybe they made it worse by doing this. But um, so yeah, then we take the what are we doing? Here? We took in the bounding box. Oh yeah, freezing it at last frame so we can get the overall volume scattering points, generating color gradients that then gets used in shading later on. Um, so we can kind of control the, the gradients, the colors of the lockers, which is cool. Houdini is great, guys. If you haven't tried it, you should totally try it. <laughs> um, and then we're also using, do you know this part? You know, the animating of the opening. Oh, yeah. Do you remember? Vaguely, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So basically, we, it's the distance to the travel. So for each one, when it opens, we kind of... and it, it, it's still not fully open. We, we, we use that attribute to kind of control the rotation of the polygon. So we, we make it pivot so that it feels like the locker is actually open. You can sort of see here. So we're inverting the matrix again, applying the transformation. You'll see in a second, there you see it with the, that attribute. So it's, it just does that to add a little bit of extra interest. Otherwise it would just be like, you know what I mean? Uh, that means it's not that fun. So if you see here, we're bypassing the last transform, and you can see them all laid up on top of each other based on the attributes. Uh, so the only input is really the animation of the extrudes in the beginning, and then everything else just propagates through. Here we are isolating the high res and normalizes it, and then apply it with the same rest position that we created upstream. Merging in with the rest. Job done. That's it. So let's move on. We have, we have more of these to get through. So you can see here, this is a, a little overview of the scene. We've made a little behind the scenes. You can see it from two perspectives. We've even rendered an unrenderable camera to make sense of it. Put in like a fake grid pattern so it looks like we're all like behind the scenes of shit. You know, it's not really the viewport, but it's a made up version of it. So we did that for all of them to kind of like give us... Um, I'm not going to talk about this one too much. Um, this is the... The commute conceptually, it's like the idea of instruments uh, in chaos. You know, if everyone plays a different note, it creates a really stressful situation. And also combining that with rush hour and people just flooding out of the trains, right? So, yeah, conceptually, pretty interesting. I, I think, I don't know. So, yeah, there we go. A bunch of rigid bodies. Animated long curves. We're not going to go in too much into this uh, this one. We have uh, other things to talk about, but you can see we've done the same thing here. Um, a little overview. No idea what it says on this um, <laughs> um, screens there, but you know, pretty interesting one. Some of them are totally just stacked up behind the camera, as you can see in the bottom right there, <laughs> just flooding out. But yeah, it's fun. The other one is so this is the office scene. Um, being overwhelmed and the idea of load steps and voxelization so we're basically simple concept right you just take objects and 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 reduce their their resolution in reality and then the further away from camera they get they uh basically you know becomes a pixel uh, in the end you know that's the idea simple concept you can see on the screen there the imac we have old social distancing running on the screen, just a little Easter egg. Uh, and all of these are, have their own sound design in, the, in their own like uh, loops as well. But I'm muting that now because... There's a how few Easter eggs in there. There is a few. Uh, do, you, do you know any other ones? In the school, there's a poster for the Panoply Dance Workshop. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> you should all come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it will be hosted tonight. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, and then we have, yeah, again, the overview. Um, there's a few things in the back that actually doesn't voxelize, I, I noticed there, but they're probably behind. It's not perfect, but again, we're looking at it from a camera perspective, so it's fine. Don't worry about it. YOLO. And then we have the garden. Maybe I'm moving way too fast, so we have all the time in the world now. Like, I don't know, it's whatever. But Anyway, this is the garden, uh, 15 minutes in. So this is the garden scene. Uh, I'm going to give it a bit of a bit. listen to it a little bit. They all have their own little design too. 
So visually, this one has uh, quite a bit of... This was a very particular scene because we wanted to be close to the water surface in order to get a sense of speed. All of these share exactly the same camera move. So we basically had to raise that, but we also wanted to get through the window in order to wipe on from previous scenes. So there's a little bit of a... Well, the way we designed it, it has quite a bit of vertical verticality with parallax through the different plants and the ceiling above and then also flying between these blobs that are coming up um so yeah again garden scene we're going to be talking a little bit about these things and how we use the pdg for this to kind of uh, um you know be able to scale it and, and design it on a small scale but then apply it to many and and and, and, and simulate them on the network here we go Get ready for another unorganized node graph by yours truly. So, yeah, we're starting out with our little uh, pond. Um, here's the camera move. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> and then we basically just painted a few blobs on it. So this is kind of based on the camera we wanted. And you can see I've kind of painted black on some areas where it probably wasn't where i wanted it because it was intersecting with the camera but that's the beauty of this you can kind of like test things and and, and simulate them all individually so um then we're blurring it a little bit to smooth out the corners and deleting outside polygons we just want to essentially create these little islands that then we can use the connectivity to create a class attribute so that they have an, an old a, a unique attribute for each um we don't run a very basic you know top network here where we're bringing in that that those islands and and partitioning them based on that class attribute so now we can run essentially 18 different sims um in parallel uh, on a network um, or on a single machine we just populated a solver a sub solver inside of the actual tree you could reference it outside this is not necessarily how i would recommend doing it but we did it that way um, and then once they're done, all these dots become green. And then once they're all done, we can kind of do the stuff below here, which we get into in a minute. So, but if you didn't have tops, you would literally have to run a sim, wait for it to finish, maybe go grab some food. Maybe it takes hours. Maybe you need to wake up in the middle of the night and then like come back and uh, you press know, one button. Yeah, go press one button. <laughs> so here we can see a little bit of a preview we have uh, with the other environment. Um, and there are the islands, and then we run all the sims, uh, and we'll see kind of what that looks like here. So this way, it's much quicker. You can literally design one of them and have it iterate quite quickly. And then once you're happy with the general logic of it, you can apply it to all of them and run them in parallel, which is awesome. So you don't need to know much about PDG in order to kind of like do something like that, which is why I'm showing you that. We're complete beginners when it comes to that stuff, but it's it's really powerful. So then we take the first frame and we're generating UVs on these uh, little islands. Um, so you can see here, little UV islands, laying them out, beautiful. Uh, and then we're scattering points on this to create a point cloud that we can then, or particles that, that hold that attribute with it. So this is basically what we see on, on the bottom here, uh, UV in its PC, that's basically just that information being stored. And then we sp we have a solver running afterwards. And you can see it's kind of forking as well, the network, we'll talk about that. But that means that essentially they can run in parallel um, those sims at the same time, because they're not dependent on each other. So here we have the point cloud, very basic, just averaging the positions and, you know. But because it's moving with it now, we have an attribute that can be transferred over to the ever-changing um, meshes that they are with a constant kind of UV coordinate. Uh, we're also taking them and making them into converting to VDB. We want to merge them with the actual pond. Uh, so we, these are quite low, low res, but it was fine because we were doing a lot with textures on this one to kind of up -rest them after the fact. Um, here we have the pond merged in, and then we're doing a little bit of a cleanup where they can join. We're just creating a little mask that sits just above the surface to kind of blend the two together. And of course, that takes a minute, so enjoy that. <laughs> there you go. So there we have the blending of them. Mm, converting it to polygons again. Um, VDBs are great. Love it. 
but it can be slow. But the benefit of PDG is that you can cache this on multiple machines if you wanted to. Um, and then we're deleting all the kind of below a certain Y coordinate, basically storing that to disk. And that becomes our second or our, our next phase of the actual PDG networks. So it's pretty, pretty basic. And once it's cached, it's pretty fast, you know. And now we have a, cons a surface we can then texture. Um, so that, that part there uh, correlates to the combined surface on the right. So you can see it forked there. It should be forked on the left side. I, I'm trying to mirror the network in a simplified manner here. Um, and once everything is done, we have the UVs and the UV particles. We have that. We can then transfer that attribute over. And we'll see here in a minute. Don't worry so much about the flat surfaces because we didn't use this for much. It was only for like little bubbles and stuff in the on the surface. But you can see here, I kind of preview that how the coordinates are now moving with and distorting with the the blobs, so to speak. So yeah, so once we've done that, we have our level overview here. We added some vellum uh, kind of leaves. Kind of interact with it. We added some particles. We added a few other steps, but I want to keep this as an overview because I don't want to don't even do too deep into it. And the main thing is utilizing PDG as a way of scaling a setup and building something simple in a small control manner, and then scaling it or processing loads of geo on other machines while you keep working, which is great. So if Andreas here uh, isn't using his machine enough, I can use it while I'm working, which is great. Um, the next scene is this one, which is uh, the living room scene. Uh, do you want to have something to say about this? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I quite like this one uh, out of a multitude of reasons, but what I found particularly interesting about it was the concept of uh, having these sort of start to swim a bit. I don't know if any of you have ever come home from a stressful day or you had maybe a bit too much to drink and you you lay there and you look at the ceiling or you look at some objects and they start like drifting a bit. I've been there. And uh, that's kind of the, the concept behind this. And these snaps kind of are these breaks in reality, uh, which is kind of why I went into, or like we went into this. It's also nice that it's, um, you know, we have very regular lines in our artificial environment. Like, yeah. you know, if you think about architecture or whatever here everything is like really straight and it's like a complete contrast to that and we have that with the snap almost like you're breaking or something and it happens as you see as soon as the camera goes over the 90 degree turn that's when stuff stuff goes crazy yeah and yeah also here running this on these multitudes of objects at the same time was really really beneficial to iterating fast so um, and again, PDG is a useful thing here, right? You can you can design it on one element and apply it to others. There's a few stills of it from the scene before the <laughs> madness and then after, <laughs> um, and we have some really nice details here as well with like the lamp becoming this spaghetti shit and like we have a mirror that's barely visible. Because, yeah, like, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> that so is it's like breaking swimming the, out yeah. of the sky, yeah, or, or with the the wall. So pretty fun so I have a little preview here this should be great oh yeah that's that's better um yes yeah, so what we're doing here is uh we're we have like a model and we're taking out everything but the chair uh there is a quite a useful note uh, which the match sizes where you can get the, a transform for that object then sort of later you can put it back where you found it with that transform that lives on the on the detail level so here we're just animating the the chairs. It's like they're snapping in two different directions, and we have two clips that are basically mirrored. And um, so once they get merged back together, you can see that they're the whole object again, basically. Um, then we're filling them, and the thing with the clip is you get a direction and not a rotation. And when you want to UV this patch that you get back from the polyfill, uh, you kind of need to translate the direction into an Euler rotation, which is what we're doing here. It looks a bit more complicated than it is because the part down here, um, the chunk that's a bit further down, is just uh, basically an evaluation. If the direction is exactly from the Y coordinate, 
because we're building it here with uh, as a cross product, then it sort of switches the compared to uh, the Z direction instead of the Y direction. Uh, and so the benefit of what we're doing here is actually just generating a coordinates for the UV prediction of the sliced parts, right? Exactly, yeah. 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 So there's a really neat node which is quad to Euler and then you convert that to degrees and you get a, an attribute out that is in degrees, which you can put in here because this doesn't work with the direction but the rotation. And uh, yeah, then you need the index to get the correct attribute. That's, that's a lot of fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the puzzle of a dinghy, figuring out weird shit. There we go. And yeah, then we have basically our animation done. And this is the attribute where you, where you put it back with the, the one that we stored from up here. Exactly. So um, then we're caching it out and clamping it so we get the last frame so we don't uh, run into issues there. And on the right stream, which I think where we, we're going, yep, uh, we're taking that last frame, remeshing the patch from the from the polyfill and uh, caching it out as well for ease. And then this is quite a neat trick. Uh, I'm sure the labs you know uses something similar, but where you can just run over each piece and remesh it that way, so you have way faster remesh times. Um, then over here, we're just uh, transferring the velocity from from the snap, basically, because we're going to use that in the custom solver down there to basically, as it transitions from the actual shape to the sort of wobbly mess, we get some velocity inheritance. And um, that's pinning it as well, though, right? But that's... Yeah, yeah, we're storing the neighbors here. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. It's not important. Um, yeah, so in here, we're, we're going to dive into that in a sec. So this is kind of how it starts to drift with that velocity data. Um, so as, we, as you saw, we stored the neighbors up there, which we're going to use in here to basically create uh, an averaging of positions uh, within this loop. So we're grabbing the position from the first input, but with the element number of, of our neighbors. And we're just dividing that by the number of neighbors that we found to Average basically... Average their position, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And yeah, that's what we're doing here. Then we're mixing that with our original position just based on a value that worked. There's nothing inherently <laughs> procedural about that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, up here we have this velocity inheritance, which is just keyframed as well. So over the first few frames we're sort of adding that velocity to the position to make it drift a bit in the direction it's How dare you use keyframes? <laughs> it's not procedural. And yeah, we're clamping it so it doesn't sort of go through, through, the, through the ground. Good idea. <laughs> Good yeah. stuff. And then in here, what we're doing is we're also clamping the position so it again, doesn't go through the to the ground and we're just creating another average uh, vector of our positions with the point cloud. Uh, we're using that uh, AO that we generated earlier as well to sort of have the edges or the... It's like a mask yeah, for a the mask effect. Yeah, a mask for the yeah. effect basically. Yeah. And yeah, we're using that to sort of push it around a little bit. And, and it's because we wanted to also keep some areas straight so it didn't all get blobby, right? Yeah, we also did have a sort of a mask where we just take the rest position and our distorted position and sort of blended it in post with, with, a, with a mask brush, I believe, as well, mm. which uh, helped. But which is what, what's really nice about this is you get the constant point count, but you still get this sort of organic, growing, distorting sort of shapes. Because of the averaging rather than remeshing it. Exactly. Yeah. So and then we can just take the remeshed original and distort it with the point deform. And you get the UVs, you get the textures, because that was a big issue in the beginning when we were thinking, how can we keep sort of the fidelity and the textures and the detail of the objects so it doesn't switch and it looks weird. Mm. So that's how we how we kind of tackle that. I mean, and the transfer of velocity really helps as well in transition, right? Yeah, you can see it in the first few frames when after the snap it sort of drifts a bit and then it sort of equalizes and finds its sort of swirly equilibrium there. And these switch nodes are just basically so you can set the point when this happens. 
because as Simon mentioned, as soon as the camera hits this sort of 90 degree angle, that's when start, uh, shit starts to get weird. So yeah, that's about it. So yeah, here you can sort of see an overview of the scene again. We've done, you can see the mirror that we talked about, but it's going out of shot, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so it, that process has been applied. Just slight tweaks to it, to some of the other things, like the the, yeah, the was pictures, it, the pictures on the wall. They do, they just do the snap and they stay that way. We just felt, liked it. And then the, there's the glitch on the screen as well that yeah. kind of breaks up with the lamp as well, which isn't done like the other ones, which is done with a, an actual um, with lines, with mm. like um, a very popular thing with the I mean, this thing. yeah, exactly. Uh, he's referring to this. Yes, exactly. As a close up of it. Yeah, no, it's cool. Uh, very cool. Um, so the last scene in this film, I'm just going to check on the time. We're kind of good. We might good. even be able to get through We're everything. Flying. Flying through this presentation. I hope you, are you still alive over here? Everyone's <laughs> really quiet. So yeah, so this is the last scene. Uh, the bar scene. I'm going to play with audio just so you hear something about our voice for a minute. There we go. So yeah, again, this, these are the individual loops that are looping into themselves. Um, the idea here is, you know, if you have a, if anyone has ever had a migraine, <laughs> you know, everything is really sharp. It's the sound of glass breaking. And, and the idea is that the lights, you know, you get really sensitive to light. So the lights become essentially really big and they become, in this case, they become planets and like start pulling things into their orbits. That was the idea here. We, we just came up with weird shit for each scene that, that we wanted to do, so... Yeah, I really feel like when you're when you're at a bar and you start to get really overloaded with all the people chatting, I feel like this kind of feels very similar. Like, as, as you mentioned, all this glass, you hear all the glass, you hear all the people, the noise, which um, I think is quite... It's quite a good... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Concept. I, think, I think it works. Uh, it's a good way to end the project on it as well, because it's quite... All, all out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's here's some stills of that. You can see there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of particles, a lot of pieces, a lot of sim, simming. Um, which norm we, normally we don't do much of. Oh, well, we do a lot of simming, I should say. We just do a lot of random sop solvers and stuff, but this was running in Bellum. So once again, we're going to be talking about PDG. It's uh, kind of the, the theme. Of, the, the reality is we just finished a project that I really want to talk about. But it's too soon. So next talk I do, whenever that will be, will be a lot, a, a really interesting. A lot of tops again. Yeah, a lot of tops. We basically <laughs> scale the scale the unscalable, run <laughs> mega complex system across hundreds of objects, and then build in. So that that's for another day. But the principles apply. The same principles apply. So here we have the um, bar scene, I should say, with or the objects uh, that have been placed out there. We have. Built a little top system here around it to kind of show you how that works roughly and how we like to structure things. Um, so there's a lot of similar similarities to what we looked at before, but um, we have it. We usually put like a little version and null here that just helps to save the the for our paths for where these files are saved on disk. And then we have a message tree here. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't judge us. Uh, you're not meant to see this anyway. At the top left, um, we have our planets, uh, and then on the top right, we have our instancing. So we'll, we'll have a look here um, at what we have. So this is the planets themselves, or lights, and their kind of timing uh, that they have. Um, we don't need to worry more about that than that. And then here we have all of our pieces, uh, all kind of just placed and uh, fractured as well, because I should say, these are the high-risk pieces that we have fractured uh, we'll go through here. So we're doing a simple Baroni on all these pieces. And then we're running an Invoke, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Evoke is an... Talk about it in a minute. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's there. Just know that it's in every one of these networks. Uh, and then replacing them in, in, in different scenes. These are just the different parts of the environment. In a really messy manner placed and here's that invoke so every time it runs the invoke it essentially runs this uh, compile block which um, applies uvs to the cut pieces basically all the inter internal surfaces um, yeah that's a really useful way that i learned from paul ambrosian i hope i hope i'm not butchering his name he's going to have a talk 
tomorrow, I think, as well here with uh, Moritz. Um, it's really useful if you want to do the same thing over and over again in different like gra like uh, branches, and you want to tweak them also at the same time. So yeah, so then the next thing we're doing is we're creating a quite important attribute here. We're using uh, PTID, which is basically based on we're finding whichever planet is the nearest to where we were. So we're taking our planets, we kind of converting it to a single point per planet. Um, so here you see some points. Uh, and we're just recording that information um, onto our, 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 our packed or our, our data. Um, so that gets stored now. And, and this is where we get to the PDG stuff. So here we go. That's the first fracture geo that we're generating. Uh, after that, we have our, we're converting uh, all of this data to a SIM geo. So we're going through each connected piece and remeshing it and storing it in a group and then also merging into high res geo and passing that through. Um, and this is going to be useful later for when surfacing this, but also running the same on the kind of remeshed uh, version of it. So that's the next part. Um, then we're doing a little bit of a dirty thing again with animation, like where we're like trying to time this to our planets. This could have been procedurized, but we wanted to have the control. So we're basically just spreading an attribute based on distance, but also I should say based on uh, the surface area of the object. So if you have like a really small object, you want it to be affected by the gravity force sooner. So all of those combined are cached and stored in this progression. So we can see here, um, there you go, progression gets cached. And this is something that isn't, it's time dependent, but it's not a uh, simulation because it's based on attributes. So it's something that you can, again, run on multiple machines or stuff. And you can see that the small objects here are picked up sooner um, and then bigger. Some are ramped through quicker to get a more explosive effect. Um, and once all of these are done, once all that is cached, we end up with, with uh, it waits for all of them. And then we're generating a work item for each planet again. And then, then they can run separately in their own vellum sims. So we can again tune the settings of that there on a single island and then run uh, everything through. Um, so down here we have our vellum sims. So what we're doing here is we're actually deleting everything except the currently running instance. So think this is like a feedback loop, like running, it's like inception shit. Whole... You're, you're doing a feedback loop for each, but on the entire hip file, essentially. So we're creating dimensions with this. <laughs> um, that, that, so that's pretty cool. So here you can, we can click this little dots here. We'll see the different parts of what it's going to keep, you know, and that then goes into its sin as well. So that goes into the individual sims. Once that's done, we are caching that out. And we can see here, this is a uh, one of the sims. And again, we can kind of go through and see the results. Um, and we can load in all of them afterwards and kind of assemble it to the main scene and uprest them by putting the high rest geometry on top of that. Again, using point performance, I think. So we made some play blast here, uh, first with the entire scene, but also with some of these, we can kind of see in detail what this would look like uh, on their own as they're starting to be pulled apart. You can see the small objects here are being paired up first because they're lighter and it takes all of this individual. And this is all simulated with just a vellum and that's altering the mass. So if you set mass to zero, it's not part of the sim. It doesn't move. It's like a multiplier and everything. So it was a very simple sketchy setup <laughs> yeah we did a lot of iterations on that one though yeah but it, we had it was RBD the best way. and then we went to this it was definitely the best this one, just right? felt more like you know this kind of slow motion shots when you blow up a space station it just tears it apart and maintains some sort of structure you can still control it with rigidity but they still like pull apart the obvious in a, in a quite nice way so it's quite crazy and obviously these are now like i don't know how many it was six or eight different Sims running in parallel. You can't really tell that they're not interacting with each other. I think in the end, though, we did end up, run, once we've tuned it, we just ran it all as one sim because yeah. it was kind of fine. But it's really helpful to be able to split up sims like that. There's also the planets are invisible, but they're colliding with it as well. So but it's pretty cool. So that takes us to, to the scene itself. I'm going to keep an eye on the time. We are good for now. So once again, we rendered the camera in there, so you can see where it where it travels. So you can see the view. This is totally what the viewport looks like in our imagination. <laughs> in a few years. In a few years, maybe. Yeah. 
be cool. So we've now gone through, and uh, those are you know the scenes of the realization. We really enjoyed this project. It was a little fun little exercise in making stupid shit, um, but it was fun. Um, depending on time now, I have another project which uh, we've talked. I've talked about this in the past. We have twenty minutes. I'm going to try to get through the first part because not everyone might be familiar with. 10 minutes. Okay, we'll skip the first part. So I refer to everyone to like go back and watch my previous talk because I covered a little bit more in detail on how this was modeled. But this is a product that kind of uh, plays on the idea of uh, kind of cliches in CG, like Veroni shapes, and then merging that with um, interior, interior design and like architectural forms and stuff. And it's an exercise in, in balancing uh, hierarchies of visual aesthetic forms. So like you have simple areas, you have complex areas, and it's balancing that through procedural modeling. And also by animating it in a way that also goes in that concept with the concept of kind of bridging the artificial and the, and the, and the real world elements. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit how, I'm not going to show how it's made. So go back to the other talk for that. But I'm going to show you, um, basically, we're using uh, curves uh, to animate using an HGA that we built to kind of just animate these uh, blocks as a model. And I'll show you the, the video, and then we'll go through the kind of top, top stuff afterwards. Oh, actually, I muted it on my end, so don't worry about the audio. <laughs> I thought I had access to that little slider. But anyway, you, you can see what it's doing. Um, you can check that out on our website you know, or on our Vimeo. I don't use this Vimeo anymore. Sadly. Uh, sadly. That's, what, that's the thing about the derail as well. We wanted to make something long form because everyone is just keeps doing this really short little clips. And we're like, okay, let's do something really tests people attention span. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, we're going to talk about this. So, I've used it as an example here again, setting up a very similar top network to what we talked about before but included like a render and a comp to it as well. So you can do stuff that basically um, animates uh, animate stuff, builds model set textures and, and runs um, a comp at the end. So in this case, this is the most basic thing. This is the first thing you learn about tops, wedging. So this just generates an attribute, which is basically a fork of reality. So we generate <laughs> a global seed, essentially, uh, that it can be used to run the system in a different parallel universe, if you will. <laughs> so every time we click one of these, it updates the entire, all the caches, all the renders, all the comps, everything. And, and, and we basically just dressed, used the VOR here as an example to kind of demonstrate how easy it is to kind of apply it to any project you're working on. It's so useful to be able to cache multiple cache points like this and be able to step away when it's ca if you have a lot of dependencies, you know. So we have this tree, as I mentioned, and you can see here as well that this correlates to the scene view correlates to that render as well. The first thing we're doing is we're generating a initial shape, which this is the tree. Again, look at the previous presentation to kind of get through what it actually does. But we're generating uh, scatter points here that are cutting the geometry and generating a low-res cage um, input uh, proxy geom, we could say. It's not going to be rendered. It's just going to be used for animation and also as a seed for the, the main feedback loop that models all these elements. Um, so here we can see those. Serial bar generator. Serial bar generator. So here you see the two different panels. You see it's splitting into two distinct areas, and that's what you see here as well. So again, we're mirroring the main tree here the high-risk cache, and in this case, we have six different instances of that. Um, so you can see the, that geometry here. Um, very nice indeed, if I might say so much. I like this product. I like this product a lot. I think it's simple and, and in its aesthetic, but I think sometimes it's nice to just go back to simple forms, <laughs> like the Roni shapes. Um, so that's the high-risk and low-risk, what happens when you actually run that main feedback loop. And once again, I'm demonstrating the beauty of tops, where you can click and get different iterations. You can generate thousands of these. So another good thing about it is stress testing your setups, because sometimes you might have this 
odd case where something crashes on a specific specific thing. So if you need to make something really rock solid, it's a good idea to stress test layers. Next thing we're doing is we're generating a COM tree, which is essentially the skeleton of the animation. It's just a spline, and we're using an HDA that we developed to just take that and fold it using uh, matrices and stack transforms. Um, and applying that to the pack prints. We're then doing a, a, a little bit of other stuff. We're essentially um, meshing it, but we're also doing a thing where we're kind of projecting some small pieces onto others to create an, an intentional glitchiness that kind of speaks of the kind of um, stop motion and weird glitchy reality um, that we're done smoothing out a little bit here with another solver. Uh, so the block mode solve, that's a solve that would run on one machine then. Uh, in order to kind of smooth out that process. Yes. Wrapping up. Yeah, lovely. So yeah, here you can see a few different seeds of that uh, animating now. And then, you know, why not run it on like 20 seeds? <laughs> and, and you can now click through these and see various different versions of that. So uh, I have it brought into new here to kind of show um, some iterations. So these are just 20 different iterations running it as a video in one frame per second, which you don't do very often. But in this case, it was kind of useful to demonstrate that. So yeah, that's pretty much it for uh, what we have time for uh, by the sounds of it. So um, I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, but We don't. We don't. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you for coming. But I hope you enjoyed it. They'll be around, uh, so please uh, see Simon after, and uh, Andreas as well. Thanks, guys. Really, really cool presentation. Thank you. Nice one.